I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Well, if you were a student and were listening to the first reading and you heard Balm of Gilead, you said, wait, that's not in 1 Timothy. You are correct. That was Jeremiah that we read this morning. Do you believe? Do you believe? Father, did you hear this? <laughs> Sounds like a basic question. That was supposed to be rhetorical, but thank you for answering it. It sounds like, like that's just a baseline question, one of, of just basic Christianity, right? Just base, do you believe? Every week, right after the sermon, we stand and we say the Nicene Creed, and if you know the Nicene Creed, which you all do because you're all good Episcopalians, you know that it starts, we believe. And what we profess is our belief in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But do you believe? So I want you to do a little exercise with me. This is the Book of Common Prayer. It's in your pew pocket right in front of you. Open that up to page 304. And if you're a student of, of uh, this book, you'll know that we're in the baptismal section of the book. And it is our baptismal creed, which is the Apostles' Creed. And the, the, the uh, celebrant will ask, do you believe in God the Father? And the first words out of your mouth are, I believe. And then he'll ask if you believe in Jesus Christ and your first words out of your mouth are I believe. And then God the Holy Spirit and your response is I believe. Do you believe that Jesus is God the second part of the Trinity? Do you believe that Jesus is reconciling death on the cross paved the way for a relationship with God? And if you do believe these things, and you believe that Jesus is your Savior, and that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are co-eternal and co-creator, all of which you profess in the creeds, how does your belief influence your life? Now, as I'd mentioned before, these are rhetorical questions. Questions that deserve answers. Well, there's too many of us to answer all that here today. But in your heart, you can begin to answer them. And sometimes the answers come with hard words. Sticks with sharp ends that poke and hurt. Luke offers today in our gospel lesson a glimpse into the teachings of Jesus. This week we hear Jesus offering a parable to his disciples of a dishonest manager who is about to lose his job. Now, if you have trouble understanding this parable or understanding or uh, absorbing this parable, take heart. You are not alone. There are many, many uh, scholars and theologians who also struggle with this parable. And the section that always sticks in my craw is in verse 9 where Jesus tells the disciples to be like the dishonest manager. Wait, what? Are you telling me, Jesus, that when I pray for you, pray to you to help me pass that test that I haven't studied for, that cheating's okay? Are you telling me that when I don't have any money in the bank and I go in and demand $100, that I should expect it to be given to me? Are you telling me that it's okay to be dishonest with my wife? Guilt, I'm not dishonest with you. With my family or with my partners, business partners. At the heart of this parable is the message that we are lost and need to be found. That our hearts have lost their focus on God. Solomon wrote in his Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. You can look it up. The parable of the manager speaks especially to Christians or communities who have lost their vision of the larger picture. Who are the people of God and what have they been called to do? When we have no idea where we are going, the treasures in front of us are hardly treasures at all. 
They are simply things. Things that have no larger value beyond our own need for them. These things are easily, too easily become objects to be used and misused and manipulated. Now, if you're still having trouble with this text, here's a slightly different version. Among those in the crowd to whom Jesus was addressing in this parable were Pharisees, whom Luke's narrator, the narrator, characterizes as the lover, lovers of money. That's verse 14. Leaders of the chosen people, the Pharisees. Keepers of the treasures of God. They were like the dishonest steward. They had lost their vision of who God had called them to be. They had traded their call to, to be God's people, to become servants of the treasures of the present day, controlled by wealth, by money, even complacency. They had blended into, the, into society and lost their vision. To these, Jesus says, to paraphrase verse 13, you can either serve this present age and love its treasures, or you can love God and serve Him in this present age. But you cannot do both. One leads to death. The other leads to life. However we choose to interpret this unjust steward Children who walk in the light of the Lord understand this. We not only are entrusted with a vision of the kingdom, we are given the treasures of the king. Even in this present age with the imperfect treasures of this world, we are stewards of God. However we use what we have had before us, we should use the gifts in light of our eternal relationship with God. Now this church is beautiful, no doubt. And it is one of those gifts given to us. And it's a great gift. And if we use this gift to the glory of God to build up His kingdom, to make disciples of Christ Jesus, then we have been just in our dealings and with the treasures that God has given us. But these treasures are not only the physical building and the physical things. They're also the people that God sends into our lives and into the life of the church. We must be good stewards of the people as well as the physical plant. Now, as a youth minister for almost three decades, I've, I learned a lot of lessons, actually, but I learned one that I couldn't get away from. You cannot lead youth or adults where you haven't been yourself. If you desire to be a good steward of God's gifts, you must first become one of His disciples. Only then can you bring people to the knowledge and love of God, making them disciples and adding to the kingdom of God. Now, earlier in my sermon, I asked a series of questions. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is God, the second part of the Trinity? Do you believe that Jesus, Jesus is reconciling death on the cross, paved a path, pathway for a relationship with God? And if you do believe that Jesus is your Savior and that you're God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, our co-eternal, co-creator, how does this how does, uh, does your belief influence your life? These questions are worth exploring and deserve an answer. The focus of this church, Church of the Redeemer, Sarasota, Florida, it's in your bulletin, is this. Together we can make new Christians and all Christians new. The clergy and staff recognize the great gift that we have been entrusted with. You. We understand that Matthew 28, 16 through 20, gives us clear direction to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the Great Commission, by the way. 
but we need your help. We need you to come along with us on this mission, the mission of this church, to help bring people together in this space so the gospel, the good news, can be preached and proclaimed. And together, we can proclaim and make disciples with God's help. So today, I ask you the question, do you believe? But today, I also ask you to come alongside the church, to join in its mission of being good stewards of the great gift God has given us. And today, it's your time to answer the question, do you believe? Amen.